evenly, and as some parts started to cool down, channel 2053 began to increase in temperature. Another release was ordered on the 8th. This time the heat rose evenly and was deemed a success. However, in the morning of the 10th, the core didn't cool down as predicted after a Wigner release. Reaching 400 degrees centigrade, the engineers ordered the cooling fans to be sped up. The radiation detectors in the chimneys recorded high levels of contaminants. It was assumed that a cartridge making its way through the core had split open. This had happened before, but the assumption was wrong. I'm sure you all love learning about interesting topics as you're watching a plainly difficult video after all. So I wanted to tell you about N60 Learning. They produce masterfully crafted books, ebooks, and audiobooks that you can enjoy in just 60 minutes. And if you're like me, that's pretty useful as there are definitely not enough hours in the day. My favourite in 60 learning volumes so far are Jesse James, The Infamous Outlaw, which I listened to on audio, and Leland Stanford, The Double Life of a Railroad Tycoon, which I read recently. I especially like the audio since I can multitask when I'm walking my dog, on the commute, or like recently on a road trip. In the description, you'll find a link to the learning list where you'll get the first two sections of Alexander the Great, Student of Aristotle, Descendants of Heroes, for free. Channel 2053, the source of the uneven heat, didn't have a split cartridge, but instead had a cartridge on fire. Due to the fans speeding up, the fire spread to other channels, and radiation levels increased further still. Staff outside the plant could see smoke coming out of the chimney of Pile 1. As the heat rose in the core, the operating staff began to realise that the core had actually caught fire. Tom Hughes, the assistant reactor manager, and another member of staff, put on protective clothing and went to personally inspect the face of the core. Hughes later said in an interview, We saw, to our complete horror, four channels of fuel glowing bright cherry red. Tom Tuoy, the reactor manager, then climbed the reactor building in full protective equipment to inspect the reactor exit, where he too saw glowing fuel. The reactor operators tried to cool the core by turning the fans to maximum speed, but this again fanned the flames. Tom Chuoy suggested pushing some of the burning cartridges out of the reactor by using scaffolding poles. However, by this time, the core was white hot and the cartridges were impossible to move. One of Hugh's colleagues would later say, It was just white hot. Nobody, I mean nobody, can believe how hot it could possibly be. Carbon dioxide was ordered from Calder Hall's reactors to try and suffocate the flames, but the attempts were inefficient as sufficient quantities could not be administered to the cores. By the 11th, 11 tons of uranium were on fire with temperatures recorded at 1300 degrees centigrade, and the reactor core was close to collapse. Chu Hoy suggested using water to douse the flames. But this plan was risky as water could react with the oxidizing molten metal leaving pure hydrogen and essentially having the ingredients for an explosion. With no other choices, Joy ordered the water to be used. Several hoses had their nozzles cut off and directly placed inside the channels of the core, one meter above the heart of the fire. Joy once again climbed the reactor to observe the water and to check for signs of the water's hydrogen reacting with the core. Unfortunately, the plan didn't pay off and the water failed left. to extinguish the fire. The decision was then taken to shut off the air cooling and the vents to the reactor. Chuoi ordered everyone out of the reactor building except himself and the fire chief. Once again, Chuoi yeah. climbed the reactor building to report on the state of the fire. Gradually, over. the flames started to subside. The inspection plates used to view parts of the core were unopenable. This was due to the fire trying to suck as much air in as possible to keep burning. Chuoi later said, I have no doubt it was even sucking air through the chimney at this point to try and maintain itself. The first flames went, then the flames reduced and the glow began to die down. I went up to check several times until I was satisfied that the fire was out. I did stand to one side, sort of hopefully, but if you're staring right into the core of a shut down reactor, you're going to get quite a bit of radiation. The fire was finally out, but water kept on pumping through the core for another 24 hours until it was stone cold. The fire released 20,000 curies of iodine-131, 594 curies of cesium-137, and 324,000 curies of xenon-133. Although this number has been disputed to be higher, it would have been even higher if it wasn't for the filters known as Cockcroft's Folly. 
Radioactive materials sped across the UK and Europe. The dispersal of iodine-131 was linked to cancer, even though it only has a half-life of eight days. But the way the human body consumes the material is by storing it in the thyroid. Around 2 million litres of milk from 500 kilometres squared was destroyed by dilution and eventually dumped in the Irish Sea. However, no one was ever evacuated from the surrounding areas. The effects of the event were played down by the British government as at the time plans were set by Prime Minister Macmillan and the US President Dwight D. Eisenhower of having a joint nuclear weapons project. Unfortunately, due to the government's wanting to sweep the event under the rug, many of the staff that played a key role in preventing a much larger disaster went unnoticed. It, Even though Tom Chuoy had taken on one of the most dangerous uh, jobs by plan? personally viewing the reactor and its molten fuel cartridges, his exposure to radiation didn't cause many long-term effects as he lived to a ripe old age of 90. The wider wind scale site was decontaminated and continued to see use. However, pile number one remained with some 1,700 fire damaged cartridges left in the pile core. The reactor was sealed off and the reactor tank itself remained sealed with some 15 tonnes of uranium. Although pile two was not affected by the fire, it too was shut down and the construction of air-cooled reactors hasn't happened since. The site is still active being renamed Sellafield and is being used for fuel reprocessing, whilst reactors at both wind scale, including Pile 1 and Calder, are being decommissioned. This Thanks very much for watching, begins. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave comments down below, I always like new suggestions. And once again, thank you so much for us reaching 10,000 subscribers, and all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. Spike planted. This subject was suggested to me and I thought it was too interesting to pass up, so I paused what I was doing and started to focus on this. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh. It is likely that you may have discovered my channel from one of my nuclear disasters. This story is most definitely not the deadliest I've covered in terms of environmental impact, however it deserves to be remembered, as it was the only nuclear reactor incident in the US that resulted in immediate deaths, with one of the fatalities being impaled by a shielding plug to the ceiling. The SL-1 was an experimental nuclear reactor and stood for Stationary Low Power Reactor No. 1. The idea for the reactor was part of a series of experimental nuclear power plants for use in remote radar outposts in the Arctic, where the only power source had been from diesel generators. The Army had been evaluating their use of diesel generators between 1954 and 1955 and decided on a more effective replacement. The Army Reactors Branch contacted the Argonne National Laboratory who had a proven track record in reactor development on the Manhattan Project to design, build and test a prototype reactor. The Army has set out a shopping list of requirements for their new low power reactor. Some of the more important attributes were simple and reliable, easy to build, operable in the harsh Arctic environment, must be air transportable, all components limited to package sizes measuring 2.2 by 2.7 by 6 meters, and no heavier than 9.1 kilos, use minimal proprietary parts, and finally, each core loading to have a three year life cycle. The prototype would be built at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho Falls, Idaho, which was pretty isolated, with ground being broken in July 1957. After a year almost to the day, July 1958 saw the construction complete and going critical in August and finally up and running in November with it formally being opened on the 2nd of December. The reactor was held within a 15 meter high them. cylindrical building made out of quarter inch steel and was known as ARA602 with a condenser fan room near the top of the building. Access to the plant was via a door through an enclosed stairwell from ARA603 to the support building. There was an emergency exit leading out to external stairs to ground level. The reactor was embedded in gravel at the bottom, 
building didn't have the same protections as a plant in a built-up area, but it was thought that any incident could be contained within the main structure. Trail. The reactor would use a boiling water design and used 93.2% highly enriched uranium fuel which would use light water in a natural circulation cycle for cooling. The water system flowed through fuel plates of uranium aluminium alloy under a pressure of 300 pounds per square inch. Spike the reactor planted. was built to house 59 fuel assemblies, one source and nine control rods. However, in general operation, it only used 40 fuel and five control components. Many of the blank spaces used dummy rods which were later fitted with test sensors. After testing, the reactor was handed over to the Army for operation and training experience, and Combustion Engineering Incorporated working as the lead contractor from February 1958. Many different personnel would train on the reactor from both military and civilian organisations, with the plant operated by two crew members with CEI staff monitoring any development, being able to step in as necessary. As the reactor aged, boron strips corroded and flaked off, and by 1960 the CEI had calculated that 18% had been lost within the core of the reactor. In November 1960, cadmium sheets were added to try and bolster the corroded boron. Leading up to the Christmas on the 21st of December 1960, the reactor was shut down for maintenance for 11 days. During this time, the instruments were recalibrated and extra auxiliary components were installed. Flux wires were also installed. These were used to monitor the neutron flux levels within the core. On the 3rd of January 1961, the reactor was being readied by a three-man team in preparation for it to be brought back online. Each man was in their 20s and consisted of Army Specialist John A. Byrons, Richard Leroy McKinley and Navy CB Construction and Electrician, First Class, Richard C. Legg. As the team worked on the reactor, two false fire alerts would be triggered, both of which were responded to by the fire department. Part of the maintenance process meant that the main control rod in the centre of the core had to be withdrawn manually to be reconnected to its drive mechanism. As the evening drew in, all three men were inside the reactor room, with Byrons and McKinley at the side and legs standing on top of the structure, supervising the movement of the control rod. At 1 minute past 9 in the evening, John Byrons withdrew the control rod too far and within 4 milliseconds the rod became critical, instantly creating enough heat to melt the fuel within the core, vaporising it. As the heat caused the fuel to expand, a pressure wave was ejected out of the reactor, creating a water hammer, which in turn lifted the whole reactor 2.77 metres in the air. Richard Legg, who was standing on top of the structure, became impaled to the ceiling by one of the shield plugs, which had been travelling at a speed of 26 metres a second. A high pressure spray of radioactive steam water hit the two men who had been working to the side of the reactor, cool. killing Byron's instantly and severely injuring McKinley. From the control rods going critical to complete destruction, only took between two and four seconds. Oh man, your camera is Another so Another fire alarm man. for the day was sounded and a slightly annoyed fire crew of six men turned up. At first it seemed oh, sorry, like another safer. false alarm with the main building intact from the outside, with only a little bit of steam emanating from the roof. However, as the crew moved towards the building and upon entering the stairwell, they found their radiation gauges were going haywire. The fire crew immediately retreated and after consulting with a doctor, made a plan of spending no more than a minute for each person inside the structure to limit the exposure. Initially, one crew member and a health physicist wearing protective equipment and gas masks attempted to enter the building. However, they withdrew after seeing 25 rotogens on their radiation meter. At 10.30pm, 